Okay, hi everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair this first session of SNUFA 2023. And uh, I'm really happy to welcome here on stage uh, our first invited speaker, who is Rodolphe Sepulk uh, from KU Leuven in Cambridge. And he's going to talk about how to shed new light on homomorphic computing through the lens of control theory. So without further ado, uh, Rodolphe, perhaps you can go ahead and share your screen. And meanwhile, for the attendees, we will welcome questions during the talk at, uh, at several points. But for that, feel free to use the Q&A button that is on the right. This is preferred over the chat. OK. You see my screen? That's good. All good. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I'm a newcomer to this conference, but it looks uh, very exciting. And um, yes, my background is control, so my talk will be heavily biased by my background, and I hope this can be helpful to some of you. So I like to talk about um, neuromorphic neural networks, and of course, uh, we can think of spiking neural networks as a sort of the prototype um, example of such networks. And uh, but I'd like to provide a sort of a control perspective to regard those uh, networks as um, control systems in order to highlight and emphasize the mixed feedback structure of these neural networks. So my talk will be divided in three parts. Um, I will first um, try to explain what I mean by this mixed feedback structure and, and what I mean by neuromorphic neural networks. And then I will uh, discuss um, the methodology to learn in such networks. And then I will come perhaps to the most exciting part, which is also the most open part, which is why. Why would be the advantage of learning with such networks comp uh, compared to conventional neural networks? So um, first part, what is a neuromorphic neural network? I'd like to start from a circuit representation of a neuron, um, which is, of course, um, common in biophysics but also, also I think has a lot of value for neuromorphic implementation and for physical realization of such networks. And the circuit representation of one neuron, so a network of such neurons would, would be a neuromorphic neural network. The circuit representation of one neuron is very classical. Um, on the left, you have a leaky storage element, and then you have a family of parallel current sources and this family can be divided in two classes of current sources what we can call internal current sources and external current sources all these current sources are voltage gated and because they are voltage gated they actually modulate continuously the conductance of the circuits what I mean by internal conductances is when the voltage gating is vo the, 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 the neuron voltage itself. So it's the internal voltage of the neuron that gates the conductance. What I mean by external conductance is when this gating is the effect of uh, presynaptic voltages. So this model is just uh, what um, neuroscientists call the synaptic connections. Um, this is what uh, neuroscientists refer to being as the ion channels, and this is what neuroscientists call the passive membrane. So we are very close to the biophysical um, representation of, uh, of uh, biological neurons. And, but, but we can also consider this as, a, as an element of a neural network where the weights that we are going to learn are the parameters multiplying the, all each of these current sources. And if you look at this expression, um, you recognize the classical expression of a synaptic um, current, which is ohmic, so it is proportional to the voltage, but it is then gated by the presynaptic voltage. And this notation means the whole past history in principle, so the his dynamics in the weights. And the whole thing is multiplied by what would be the maximal conductance of these current sources. And so the idea is that tuning, modulating, learning, however you want to code it, um, those weights will shape and determine the circuit behavior. 
course, the sort of most common example of the, perhaps a canonical example of a spiking neuron is um, the Fitzhugh Nagumo circuit that has exactly this um, physical representation of a capacitor, a storage element, in parallel with two, in this case, internal current sources, because there is no, this is a, an isolated neuron. And we know, of course, that this is a sort of a key circuit that reproduces the nerve impulse and that was proposed to simplify the equation of Hodgkin and Huxley. Now, there are a few things that I'd like to say about this, this physical representation of neural networks. The first one is that it's quite fairly general. It includes all the biophysical conductance-based models from neuroscience, but it also includes a lot of uh, simplified and artificial models that we use in neuromorphic engineering. The second thing is that I'd like to highlight the fact that I will, in, in, in our research, we put as much emphasis on the internal conductances as on the external conductances. And this is probably uh, a key difference with respect to what we currently mean with uh, uh, spiking neural networks, where we typically tune the synapses, but don't tune the internal dynamics of the neurons. And the last uh, observation I'd like to make is that if you assume that all these current sources um, have a conductance that is static, so it can be voltage gated, but only depends on the current value of the voltage, then this uh, structure becomes exactly the structure of a Hopfield neural network. So we can also regard these uh, neuromorphic neural networks as a sort of a dynamic extension of uh, the well-known and classical Hopfield neural networks. Now, the sort of perhaps the new perspective that I'd like to bring uh, into the picture is that such networks always have the representation of this uh, classical block diagram, where what I mean by the plant is exactly this uh, physical storage elements, the capacitor or the RC circuit. And then all the current, the, the, the parallel bank of current sources, you put it here, and you can divide it in two. Um, putting together those conductance that have positive conductance and those current sources that have negative conductance. Now, of course, we have to be careful because these uh, conductances can be dynamic, so they can depend on the whole history of the voltage. They are typically nonlinear. So what do we mean by um, positive conductance? That has, uh, I'm using the precise meaning that was introduced very early on in uh, circuit theory. Uh, exactly with the purpose of generalizing co the concept of conductance. And that is the concept of monotonicity, a concept that is also playing a prominent role in large-scale optimization nowadays. And I will not go into the technical details of the definition of that concept of monotonicity, but for the purpose of this talk, you can just think that it means positive conductance and that um, it has a, a well-defined mathematical characterization. Now, I also would like to highlight that once you pack all the neurons in one network, these blocks become sort of matrix blocks. This uh, current input becomes a vector of all the currents injected at the nodes, and this capital V becomes a vector of all the uh, uh, neuron voltages. So now we have a huge block here that still has the, the structure of an RC network, we have another huge block here that still has the structure of a one layer neural network. And um, we can still have the splitting between a block that has positive conductance and a matrix block that has negative conductance in this generalized meaning of Minty. And once you do that, this distinction between the positive and negative conductance becomes really crucial because the you, you see that you have fundamentally a feedback structure that is where you can separate the negative feedback loop and the positive feedback loop. Again, uh, the meaning of negative and positive feedback loop in general is difficult once you go beyond simple uh, systems. But with this operator concept of monotonicity, it provides a full definition and well-posed definition of positive and negative feedback for networks. And now the key is that um, the key significant. Well, first of all, let me uh, make this concrete by showing what it means for the Fitzhugh-Nagumo circuit. Well, the plant is just a capacitor, 
And then you see that the two other branches can be divided into one branch that is, has positive conductance and one branch that has negative conductance. And the nice thing is that if you remove the branch with negative conductance, you have essentially an RLC circuit that has fading memory. So it's it always uh, stabilized to equilibrium after a transient. And so you see the critical effect of the negative conductance as the element that provides memory, that provides um, uh, positive feedback, that uh, provides um, by stability, for instance, in the circuit. And so this is really uh, this example that is very clear and very concrete in the case of Fitzgerald Nagumo can really be made very general and applied to the entire neural network where you still have this decomposition and you still have the property that the negative feedback loop, so the black feedback loop, also has fading memory. So always converges to equilibrium after transient. It is a very stable part. Whereas the other parts, the positive feedback loop, because you have two minus sign, so that creates a positive feedback loop, is really what creates the memory of the network. And this, um, balance of uh, positive and negative feedback of this balance of fading memory and memory is really what enables memory at scale. And what I mean by memory at scale is the event of the spike that you can consider to be a memory for a very short instant of time, but then um, becomes a fading memory uh, as time goes on. And this articulation of uh, Fading memory in memory is what creates events and what can create events at many scales. Now, from the question of learning, you can really think of this entire architecture. Now you can bring together the positive and negative conductance. And you see that if you represent this for one neuron, you have a very basic structure where you have a feedback loop between standard RC circuit and a one-layer neural network. And what you tune, the parameters are the weights, are the maximal conductances of each of the current sources. That has a very concrete um, representation. You see immediately that the um, feedback accounts for many layers or can be think as a substitute for the many layers that we have in usual fit for neural networks. And you also think that these um, neuromorphic neural networks are always recurrent. So the distinction between fit for what and fit and, and recurrent doesn't is not really meaningful. I think it should instead it should be replaced by the distinction between fading memory and memory, or negative feedback and positive feedback, or positive conductance and negative conductance. And the last point is that if you make this one layer neural network static, so having if the weights have no dynamics then you are just back to the classical structure of Hopfield neural network. So we are really thinking of this neuromorphic neural network as networks that encompass Hopfield neural networks, but provide the important extension to have dynamic memories as opposed to just the static memories that we can store in Hopfield neural networks. And this is um, what I wanted to say about the architecture of these neural networks. And I'm perhaps ready to take a question at this point, if there, if there are questions. If there's any question from the audience, now is the time to pose in the Q&A. Okay, perhaps I move on then and, and we can, um, we will have a, a period of questions at the end. Mm -hmm. So the second part is, okay, once you have defined this fairly classical architecture, what can you say about the learning capabilities? And here comes my bias, because I, as a control theorist, I would regard um, learning in such an architecture as equivalent to the classical problem of adaptive control that has a long history. This is a textbook written in the 70s by Carl Astrum. And from a neuroscience viewpoint, I would consider this as a synonym of neuromodulation. And also neuromodulation has a very long history in neuroscience, in particular with the 50 years of work of Eve Marder, um, who has sort of um, 
pioneered this uh, subfield of neuroscience that is gaining um, increasing importance. And so I think we should acknowledge that because I think there is a lot that um, of research that we can leverage both from uh, classical engineering and from classical neuroscience. If you go back to this very early textbook and you look at the first chapter, which is what is adaptive control, this is the uh, first figure that you see. And of course, the connection to my uh, representation is very easy because I, I used the terminology of control of making the distinction between a plant and a controller. And you think that in adaptive control, what, what the, the way adaptive control is defined is that the controller has parameters and that these parameters are adjusted online. And so this is the learning rule, if you wish. It is a sudden feedback loop that goes around the controller and that constantly updates the parameters of the controller. And if you see that there is a direct match to this representation, where I consider the one layer neural network as my controller, if you wish, and I consider the maximal conductances as the linear, the, the parameters that linearly parameterize the, this bank of filters. You see that we are exactly in the, in the same uh, framework. And perhaps there is one thing that we can learn immediately from this textbook, is that what you learn from this textbook is that there are three conditions that make learning easy. And the first condition is that you have a linear parameterization uh, of your adaptive parameters. The second is that this system, this feedback system, has a stable inverse. So we never require an adaptive control that the system itself is stable, but we require that the inverse system is stable. And the inverse system is how you read the relation from the output to the input. And the third condition of, of adaptive control is that the plant must have relative degree one. And the bottom line of this old textbook is to say, if you have these three conditions, adaptation is easy. Now look at when we apply this to neuromorphic neural networks, we see the three conditions verified straight away. We have the linear parameterization of the maximal conductances. And it's immediate that we have a stable inverse. Why? Because the relationship from V to Y, so the inverse relationship of the neural network, is a difference of two monotone operators of V. And monotone operators are very stable, so difference of monotone operators are very stable. So the inverse of this neural network is always stable. And finally, the plant is an RC network. An RC network means that the relationship between current and voltage only involves the first derivative of the voltage, and that's the definition of relativity. So you see that these three fundamental assumptions that make learning easy are built in the architecture of the neural, the, the neural network. To me, this is one key motivation to put the neural network in this um, representation. The second thing, the second heritage that we should look at is neuromodulation. So neuromodulation, um, Eve Mother has studied for 50 years a network of 29 neurons that controls a simple rhythmic function in the crop. And some of the key experimental observations that have come out of this work is that neuromodulators, which are those neurochemicals, modulate the maximal conductance of current sources. For instance, these neuromodulators, they, they modulate the um, genetic expression of, channels, of ion channels. So they modify the, the quantity of ion channels, which in the model is exactly represented by the maximal conductance of the current source. So there is a perfect match between the role of neuromodulators in neuroscience and the role of adaptation in these neuromorphic neural networks. What you learn from this experimental work is that the neuromodulators modulate internal as well as external conductances. And an animal would go nowhere if only the external conductance were modulated. So the modulation of internal conductance has a key function that I think is too often neglected in artificial spiking neural networks. And the last thing that you see straight away is that these neurochemicals um, 
tune the, 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 the circuit over a vast range of spatial and temporal scales because each of neuromodulators, each neuromodulator comes with its own kinetics. And those kinetics really span several orders of magnitudes. And the last thing is that, you know, neuromodulator, the, the, the reason why there has been so much emphasis on neuromodulation is that it is the elements that enable stable function in variable circuits. So the entire life of, of uh, Eve Mother has been spent to show that if you take two different crops and if you measure the values of these, um, you know, microscopic parameters, like the conductances of these ion channels, you have variability from animal to animal, you have variability within animals, you have huge variability. Yet the rhythmic functions that those networks produce is extremely stable across animals and across time. How can that be? Well, I think that to me, if I had to define my research, I would say that it's essentially an attempt to reconcile, on the one hand, this very classical field of adaptive control that in principle gives us the methodological principles to, to, to develop our learning rules. And at the same time, trying to you know, bridge the gap and to try to discover how these neuromodulatory, these neuromodulatory principles of neurophysiology enable robustness in this um, training algorithm. So I'd like to spend a little bit more time on, on going into the details of this uh, of adaptive control, just by adding one picture, which is extremely naive. But the dominant methodology of adaptive control is called model reference adaptive control. And the idea is extremely simple, is that you, you, you develop your learning rule to train your network to a particular behavior, a particular reference trajectory that has been generated by a particular value of the parameters that I will call GREF. And you assume that this GREF is given to you by a teacher, by God, by name it. And now you can use your model to generate this reference trajectory. And your learning rule just becomes a linear regressor driven by the prediction error. That is by the difference between the current output of your circuit and the reference output of your circuit. Now, once you adopt this sort of imitation learning framework, the learning rule becomes extremely uh, simple and extremely documented because it's just a least square problem. You just regress by minimizing the square norm of the residuals. And if you, the most sophisticated algorithm is recursive least square estimation. And if you apply this to this, you, you get a very centralized learning rule that is in principle able to learn any trajectory that can be generated by the model. And then you have a whole hierarchy of simplification of this very centralized scheme. And you go to least mean square estimation, stochastic gradient, MIT rule, Hebian learning. And you can add many more. And you go from the bigger level of centralization and, and um, that works under very general assumptions to further and further simplification that always aim at localizing the learning rule and making it sort of a more um, biologically plausible. I think this heritage is very important. And knowing that this heritage is available as soon as you have this assumption that I have called the systems easy to learn, you know, it means that in principle, we can really uh, use and leverage 50 years of research that have essentially been developed to understand when and how we can go from a centralized learning rule that is the recursive least square estimation to super localized um, and, and biologically plausible learning rules. And some of our recent work has exactly been to apply this framework, this very classical framework, to biophysical neural networks and to show that, you know, to fine tune the details to show that it works. Yes, in principle, this theory that was developed in the 70s for linear time invariant systems can be very, very easily extended 
to these nonlinear networks that are highly dynamic and nonlinear. Now, this doesn't mean that the problem is solved because none of these schemes is robust to uncertainty. None of those schemes is yet scalable and none of those schemes has been actually implemented in your neuromorphic circuit implementation. And so this is where our research lies at the moment. But I think that the key challenge is uncertainty. And by uncertainty, I mean that this reference trajectory that you want to learn must be a trajectory of your model, meaning that your model must describe exactly the environment that you want to imitate. And this is, of course, uh, an objective that cannot be true, cannot be um, fulfilled in um, biological networks. And this brings me to the third uh, part of my talk, which is what do we need to add to this very classical framework of adaptive control so that it becomes robust and perhaps biologically plausible? And I think it's very coupled to the question of why should we learn with a NNN and what will make and what is the promise of NNNs to make learning better than with conventional um, neural networks. And there, what I would like to flag is another important um, contribution, both from control and from neuroscience, that we call the internal model principle. An internal model principle was developed also in the 70s, also for linear time invariant systems. And in words, it says the following. It says that if you have a control system that can perfectly track an external signal or reject an external signal, that's what we mean by asymptotic regulation. If we want these tasks to be robust to uncertainties of the plant, it is only possible if the controller includes a model of the environment. That is, if the, if the controller can internally generate this reference signal that I've been talking about. How is this possible? What I would like to say is that what I've described as model reference adaptive control might seem like just one way, one very naive way to solve the problem. But fundamentally, what the internal model principle tells us is that it's the only way, or that any alternative way will face the same problem that it will need an exact model of the external signal that I wish to track, or to reproduce, or to reject. All these methods share what I would call the fundamental issue of a calibration theory. That you assume that there is a perfect tuning of the parameters that leads to a perfect reproduction of the environment, which of course can never be the case in a real system. And so there is a mismatch between the requirements of stated by the internal model principle that somehow calibration is necessary to perfectly um, adapt to the environment and the fact that it is an impossible assumption to achieve because the moment you calibrate, the next day you have lost your calibration and you have to recalibrate again. Calibration will never be scalable. And calibration is something that is too fragile to be uh, plausible in living animals. And we have a lot of evidence that animals don't use calibration, and that animals are able to adapt and to learn with very sloppy models of the environment. So how do we uh, fill that gap? I think this is, to me, this is the question of neuromorphic learning. I think this is an open question. And I think this is what the answer to that question is what will make uh, neuromorphic learning um, sustainable or not. I think that most neuro current neuromorphic implementation of learning algorithms face the fact that they are fragile to the sloppiness and to the variability of the components. Where is the catch? My attempt to this is to say that so far, when I have summarized the classical theory of adaptive control, I've never referred to event-based. 
But we are not learning arbitrary trajectories when we learn spike in neural networks. We are learning trajectories made of events. And in fact, we could perfectly assume that only the events need to be learned. Only the sequences of events need to be learned. We don't lead at the exact trajectories. And my claim and sort of the research that we are developing currently is really to demonstrate that if you focused on learning the events, you don't require precise models. And that this mixed feedback that I have insisted on is precisely the ingredient that you, that you need to build event-based systems. Classical adaptive control is only negative feedback control, never uses positive feedback, so never adapts to events. And there is a lot of work, including very recent work, that shows that once you combine excitable neurons and synaptic coupling, you can reach exact synchrony between a reference circuit and a copy of the circuit, even if the elements of the two circuits are hugely heterogeneous and variable. So the trajectories will not be the same, but the times of the events will be exactly the same because that's somehow very much the nature of excitability that um, you will minimize when you minimize the you know the, the residual the energy of the residual you have to minimize the the difference between the timing of events and so you get synchrony of the events but you don't get synchrony of the trajectories and this is how you can resolve and 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 pretend to learn exact sequences of events even if you have a lot of sloppiness and variability in your internal models. I'd like to conclude with briefly summarizing the three parts. The first part is that I, I, in my research, I tried to acknowledge the feedback, the fundamental feedback structure of neuromorphic neural networks. So to me, neuromorphic learning is almost a synonym of feedback machine learning. And once you focused on feedback, I think it's crucial to make a difference between negative feedback and positive feedback. And to acknowledge that events results from the right combination of positive and negative feedback. The second uh, part of my talk emphasized the fact that the, these neuromorphic neural networks have a very specific feedback structure that make them intrinsically easy to learn. And what I mean by easy to learn is that we have 50 years of research in engineering, in adaptive control, in adaptive signal processing to understand the limitation of the learning rules and the hierarchy of learning rules that can be employed in such systems. The big problem of adaptive control is not the learning rule, it's the robustness of the learning rule. And the robustness of the learning rule is something that is inherent. The lack of robustness to the learning rule is something that is inherent to what I've called a calibration theory. My last part was to say there is a promise to nevertheless learn the events with sloppy models, provided that we focus on an event-based learning. And so if I had to summarize, I would say that adaptive control is a the theory of negative feedback learning. It is a very classical theory. It is a calibration theory. It is adaptive, hopefully, but not reliable. That is not robust to mismatch, model mismatch and model uncertainty. On the other hand, machine learning, as we use it today, is a positive feedback learning. So if you only use positive feedback, if you use Hopfield neural network, you have a discrete network and you have a classification theory. And this is highly reliable, but the price that you pay is that it's not adaptive. But once you put together negative and positive feedback, once you use mixed feedback learning with the right combination of positive and negative feedback, your theory becomes an event-based theory. And event-based sort of reconciles what we like about machine learning, the fact that it can learn reliably the events, together with what we like about adaptive control, in other words, that those systems are easy to adapt. And with this, I'd like to thank you and 
advertise the fact that if you are interested in more details on top of the references uh, that were on my slides, there will be a three-day courses on mixed feedback systems at the end of this month, and you're all welcome to join. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rodolfo, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I see now questions are popping up. So just a quick information on how it's going to work. I will ask first the question of Friedemann, uh, and then I will also start inviting to the wing uh, the next question so that they can basically accept uh, the invite and be ready to answer the question live if they want to. Otherwise, I will read it. So the first question uh, from Friedemann is, uh, neurons in the brain are embedded in stereotypical circuits. What general takeaways does adaptive control theory tell us about neuronal circuits? Yeah, I think that what they tell us, uh, what the, the classical theory tells us is that these, these circuits are easy to learn. That is that it's not easy, it's not difficult to figure out the learning rule. I think the challenge is not to develop new learning rules. The challenge is to um, make them robust. And uh, there is already a lot of um, understanding of how we can make these learning rules super localized once we exploit the time scale separation and the spatial scale separation of these, of these networks. This is very connected to the fact that once we apply this theory, if we apply this theory in general, there is no hope to make it reliable for the reason that I have explained. However, if we apply this theory to highly stereotyped rhythm, there is a big chance that we can learn the rhythm exactly even with highly sloppy, uh, very sloppy models. And to me, this is what we can learn from the, the classical theory is where is the novelty to be developed by adapting this theory to the rhythmic systems that we see in living animals. Okay, I see now that uh, Pablo has joined us. Uh, Pablo, perhaps you can unmute. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think you can hear me, maybe. Probably, yes. maybe not. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for uh, an impressive talk. I actually didn't know about this concept before. I'm sorry to be so ignorant, uh, but I really like the adaptive uh, control uh, approach. So, and we are working on similar stuff. And I was wondering because in, in the end, in the most, in the approach that you were taking, actually you can compute the closed form solution of the spiking uh, neural network to compute uh, the, the regression that you want to, to use it, but you are all the time talking about learning. And my question will be, when we will need learning? Because if we know all the dynamics of the plant, in the end, we can compute the closed form solution there. So mm -hmm. in which type of engineering applications do we really need to learn these conductances or what you are afraid to do that? Well, first of all, I think there are two aspects to, 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 to the question. So one aspect is that once you consider a network with a million parameters, uh, I don't think anyone has the, an idea how to tune those parameters, even if you know exactly the function that you want to achieve. So um, the parameterization is, is so high dimensional that in fact it includes way too many behaviors to be sort of... Um, in one-to-one in -one correspondence to the closed form solution you are talking about. Second thing is that I don't think we will ever learn from scratch. Okay? If you look at learning in animals, it's extremely modular and extremely hierarchical. I think we need to mimic um, the same uh, approach if we want to, if we ever want to use this framework to make it scalable. Okay, we need to. Um, to use these uh, stereotype um, motifs that um, the previous um, question mentioned, you know, neuroscience, the, the circuits in, in, in uh, neuroscience are not arbitrary at all. They are made of very clear motifs and these motifs are very simple, but they, ena they enable this hierarchical uh, structure of learning. I haven't talked about that. We are very early in the sort of, in the understanding of how this can be made, uh, be made uh, scalable. But this is where I see great, great value in studying and learning first very small circuits. Eve Mother always says that she has studied this circuit of 29 neurons for 40 years. She still not, not, doesn't understand the circuit. So, um, 
the, 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 the sophistication of neural modulation that you have in even very small circuit is amazing. And I think uh, we can learn a lot from, from this sort of bottom-up approach. Yeah, thanks so much again for the talk. For asking the question. So the next one is from Emre Nefci. So about animals learning using a sloppy model. What is the role of inductive biases, for example, acquired by prior experiences called pre training? Yeah, so this is where I think that the connection to internal models is very, very important. Okay, so in a, in, in, a, in a machine that would behave like an animal, the reference trajectory will be generated by these internal models. And these internal models exactly encode the learning bias, the prior experience. And what you use as a information signals to refine your learning or to adapt your learning is exactly the mismatch between what you receive from the environment through your sensory inputs and what you receive from your internal models as a sort of a, a, um, predictive clues. So I think that in that sense, um, this very abstract and idealized role of the reference trajectory needs to be translated in what can be generated internally by internal models uh, as a sort to create this mismatch between um, the environment and what you expect from the environment. Next question is from Bill Podlaski. What is special about neuromodulation that makes it so important for adaptive control in your view? Is it just that it has the capability to modulate internal conductances for each neuron? From a neuroscientific point of view, one important characteristic is that it is global, so it doesn't modulate individual synapses. Is that also important in your view? Yeah, so um, two things. The, the first thing that I find fascinating in neuromodulation is that it is so consistent with what we learn from adaptive control. So I would say that at the conceptual level, there is a Neuromodulation gives us a lot of hope that by using adaptive control of the maximal conductances, we can indeed um, learn in the presence of variability of uncertainty. The second aspect that I haven't talked much about is indeed the multiscale and the global aspects of neuromodulators. Now, this is super interesting to learn, including in these small networks, because indeed neuromodulators are global signals. However, the receptors of neuromodulators can be super neuron dependent. So a single synapse can respond or not respond to a neuromodulator. Neuromodulators are large, large uh, signals that you broadcast, but then everyone tunes its um, sort of uh, channel to the neuromodulator that it wishes to, 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 to listen to. And so there is indeed a very global aspect of the learning, but at the same time, the ability through these receptors to make it super localized and super dynamic. Also, the, 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 the range of time scales of neuromodulator is huge. In fact, even the terminology becomes blurred um, between the different types of, of neuromodulators uh, because the, the time scales are so different. So definitely, we see that neur neuromodulation is what keeps the whole brain together, in a sense, by having these signals that at the same time are very global but at the same time can um, be extremely uh, um, function specific thanks to the receptors of the neurons. Okay, perfect. We have time for one last question, a short one. So to end, this is a question from Jamie Knight. Um, to emit events at the same time, doesn't the trajectory of the internal state need to be the same? Right. So. <clears throat> Internal state, what I, in classical adaptive control, the, the, the state is actually the trajectory. So we have asymptotic adaptive control when we have asymptotic convergence of the reference trajectory to the actual trajectory. And this trajectory can keep changing. Okay, so it's really a matching of the state at every time. Instead, if you only focus on the events, you say that between the events, you don't care about mismatch. And so you get a huge flexibility. Think about how a mechanical systems can synchronize with an electrical system. You know, the two systems cannot be the same, but they can tick at the same time, even if they have very 
different underlying dynamics. So the, the full tra state trajectories of the two systems will be hi highly different, yes, yet they will take at the same time. That's the difference. Okay, perfect. Seems like we are right on time, so we'll have to switch to the next speaker. But thank you so much again for this uh, very interesting talk. Thanks so much to the audience for so many interesting questions. So now we will have to switch to the next one. So see you there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.